Good morning everyone, I hope you're keeping well. In this week's video we are in Romania. That's right, I've driven all the way through Slovakia and Austria and Hungary out the other side and I'm now in the south of Romania photographing some industrial heritage. I've been to many of these types of locations in the past, in the UK, France, Belgium, Italy and more. And they're always a challenge to photograph. So I'm gonna give you two sets of tips in this video, both about the location and your awareness and also of course, the photography. Let's do it. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is James Kerwin, and this, this is me. I'm an architecture and interior photographer from the UK that is now based in Istanbul. I love shooting heritage, abandoned places, relics, ruins, hidden gems and ghost towns, as well as off the beaten path locations all around the world. You can catch my content weekly, well, when life doesn't take over. So why don't you join me for the ride by subscribing, and you can also check out my website in the description below. My plan was actually to come to Romania for over a week to recce for my tours next year. However, this isn't part of that recce and this is just a personal visit. I've decided to visit an old power station in the south of the country. And I don't visit these locations that often. I've been to many in the past. I've been to lots of types of them over France and Belgium, UK as well. And they're always difficult to photograph and difficult to line things up, straighten things out. So I thought I'd give you a set of tips this morning both on the location itself and the photography. Let's do it. Okay, so you've found a cool location and you want to go and check it out. Check if it's any good for photography. But the first tip I'm going to give you is to make sure you thoroughly, more than any other type of location, plan ahead. Industrial locations are always set in kind of, let's call them industrial wastelands. And essentially, getting in and around them can be very difficult, challenging, maybe boggy, there might be rivers, there might be lots of different things and obstacles that are in your way. So my first tip would be to plan ahead, study maps, look at ordnance survey maps, particularly our Google Maps, and look at the geography of the region and make sure that actually what you're stepping into is going to be easy and accessible basically to, for you to be able to get around. So the next tip I'm going to give you before you start shooting is going to be about getting your bearings. And what I mean by that is when you arrive at the location, make sure everything is as it was in your research. Check your bearings, make sure everything's as it should be. Can you get through where you want to be walking? Is it safe to do so? And has anything changed since your research? Real simple tip, real quick one, but essential nonetheless. Next tip I'm going to give you is to stay alert constantly. Kind of ties into some of the other tips. And what I mean by that is in these types of locations, they tend to be darker. They tend to be unsafe. They tend to be changing conditions. It can get darker in these locations, for example, much, much quicker than it does in other low types of locations, just because of the types of materials, with small windows and such like. I've come in the winter, which makes that even more of a challenge. It took a long time this morning for the light to start to get up and into this location. And uh, I constantly have to stay alert and check my surroundings and listen out, make sure that I'm constantly safe. Okay, so the next one is gonna be about scouting your location. What I mean by that is going around, checking for the lighting, checking the conditions, checking shoot positions, and also just checking the lay of the land, where it is you're going to be able to place your bag, step, stand, that kind of thing. These types of locations are completely different to any other, and all of those factors play a huge role in getting great images. So scout the location, have a great look around, a really good thorough look around, and keep your eyes open, of course, for interesting angles and viewpoints. So in these types of locations, when you're in it one for the first ever time, you may overshoot, and that's okay. It's digital, you can do that. You can delete some and move on afterwards. However, I'm gonna give you some tips a little bit later on, so stick around so that you can kind of take some great images the first time you step into one of these types of locations. And my final tip has got to be gear. Don't overbring gear. I would say in most of these types of locations, the only thing you're gonna want is a wide angle lens, usually a full frame camera or the equivalent in crop sensor with something like a 10 to 18 mil on a crop sensor sort of system. Anything else is probably overkill. Of course, I'm shooting video today and I've got a lot more kit than necessary, but it's heavy, there's no need for it, and it's just gonna get in your way when you're trying to line up compositions. It also, of course, means that when you're selecting lenses and doing a shot selection process, it's less complicated for you when you're sort of maybe on edge or nervous about shooting the location. Less is more, and that includes kit. 
So in terms of gear, the other thing you're gonna want without a shadow of a doubt is a tripod. So it's pretty essential. Your camera's on the tripod, fixed down, and you can set up a two second timer or remote shutter, because you're gonna be wanting to shoot at F8, low ISOs to get nice, clean, crisp images, but your shutter speed then is gonna be drawn out. So you're gonna need your camera on a tripod, or you're gonna need a camera very, very good with dynamic range and boosting the ISO. So a full frame camera that's very good at shooting at 6400 and above, that would be my recommendation for these types of locations. I've got two tripods with me today. They're both gonna help me to get different types of imagery. And of course, this video, let's move in. When it comes to this style of photography, I'm by no means an expert, but there are some tips I can give you to kind of help you along the way. We're gonna be looking at both detail shots and of course, the wider shot of the room as well. They're the two main shots that I want, and they're the two key different types of shots you could get in here. Okay, another thing that's gonna play a huge role in this style of photography is the time of day that you go to the location. I was probably here a little bit early, and as the sun's gone a bit higher in the sky, of course there's a skylight here and it's been able to fill the space with light a little bit more. The time of day is going to play a huge factor in this style of photography as well. Making sure you've got a nice solid tripod, of course, I've already mentioned it's key to these kind of shots. You're never going to be able to get this kind of photography without having a tripod. You're going to be wanting ISOs very high. Those video clips I've just taken, I'm gonna put their ISO numbers and their f-stop numbers on the screen so you can kind of figure out for yourself how dark these places can be, especially early in the morning, in the first light, basically. I'm using my Canon R5, 15 to 35. And to be honest with you, most of the time I'm shooting around 20 to 24 millimeters, unless it's a detailed shot of these dials. However, on my camera seconds, things are wild to say the least. We are, I've done some exposure bracketing, but to give you an idea, some of the shots I've already taken, F7.1, 10 seconds, but my ISO was 800. I'm not worried about it on the Canon R5, but you may be in your camera of choice because it depends on what the results are like at those high SOs. And this camera, it's absolutely fine. There is a couple of other things in here that I've had to try to be careful of, and that is that there's some broken segments and light pouring in, and that means that the exposure settings can be a, bit, a little bit weird. So basically I've exposed for those so that the rest of it I can lift in post. So we're gonna be lifting in post ISO 800 and maybe above. I don't want my shutter speed going on for 30, 40, one minute. I just don't want that. I'm gonna be here for too long. Um, I wanna keep the shutter speed kind of sensible figures, 10, 15 maximum seconds, maybe 20 at a push, but realistically, I wanna try and keep those uh, sensible numbers. So I'm gonna get one of these detail shots again with you guys. Now, because of the lighting that I'm doing with the video, it's gonna make these shadow the back wall a little bit awkward so i don't want that to happen too much so one of the main things about the detail shot to bear in mind is the light you want to kind of 
watch where the shadows are falling, where the highlights are. And for me, I had a self-inflicted problem. I was recording a video and of course, it meant that, that my spot lamp was kind of causing shadows behind the, the main subject. For you, it could be skylights, it could be backlit subjects, dials, buttons, shiny surfaces. There's many things that can be a problem. So something to keep in mind. What we want to be doing is making sure that our verticals are straight, our lines are leading us, our viewer's eye through the frame and getting some nice images. And we have our tripods positioned, our height of our tripod is going to determine that and make the image look more aesthetically pleasing if it's kind of angled in the correct way. For the shot where I'm photographing the dials or the control panels, being lower helps you to be more of the kind of the level of those, getting much more detail and leading the viewer's eye through them. So the next big tip I can give you is to slow down, take your time, walk away from your tripod, position things, look in your LCD, get things where you think they're right, and then step away from your tripod, look at where it's positioned, look at where you're standing in the room. Don't just change your tripod position for composition and framing, but also change your focal length. I took a detailed shot with the 15 to 35, and I quite liked it. I've just taken another with my 50 mil here on the front of this, R5 now, and I think I prefer it. I'll pop that on the screen and you'll see the difference. Just by taking my time and thinking, would it look better compressed, a bit more compressed? It's led to a much better shot in my eyes, I believe. Now, I do prefer the detail shots over the wide angle shots in this location, which is unusual for me, but it must be said, the 50 mil is far superior to shooting at 35 mil. I mentioned gear and gear isn't always that important, but in dark locations, it can greatly assist you. The thing is, is I'm shooting with lenses that are f2.8, f1.8 today. My wide angle is 2.8 and this 50 mil here is 1.8. It means they perform really well in low light when they're sitting around f4.5, f5.6. Means that they're incredibly sharp, they're performing at their best. And also it means that my shutter speed would be a little bit lower on a full frame camera than it would be with a crop sensor or even say something like a bridge camera. That's gonna help me in these kind of dark locations. So in these kind of settings, gear can assist you. Doesn't mean it's impossible with other types of cameras. In fact, compressed shots can look much better in a crop sensor camera, but that's a topic for another day. When it comes to the main shot of the room, I'm actually having to put my tripod into a much higher position. And the reason for that is that I need to be closer to the center of the room so the ceiling, the dials, and the control panel isn't stretched. In terms of setting, things are a little bit different. We don't go to 5.6, we don't go to those low F numbers. We're looking at F7 roughly, the sharpest point of this lens. ISO though is still, of course, gonna be incredibly high, higher than it would be with my usual architecture photography. So I've taken a couple of wide shots. I'll put those results on the screen and we'll chat about them now. As usual, I've given you tips in camera for composition. That's what I do on this channel, primarily anyway. When it comes to industrial locations like this, post-processing though is particularly important and there's some masters at it and I'm by no means one of them. The colors in these kind of locations can be particularly a mix mash of colors. You can get yellow hues, white balance issues, blues, purples, reds. I even had oranges in this, quite a mix quite difficult and the best thing I can suggest is to use local adjustments to go into those colors and gradually fine tune them to get the overall look and feel to where you want it. So another great tip I can quickly give you before we finish and wrap up here is to make sure you're shooting in manual. Manual is going to assist you a lot when it comes to all of these things we've talked about so far and the reason for that is you want control over all of the settings independently and you want to be able to adjust each one and have control over them. If you're not sure about using my manual mode, I've done a video before linked on the channel here, talking all about how easy it is in this style of photography when you're using live view. And that's what we're doing here today. So yeah, you wanna be able to adjust your f stop, your ISO, and of course, constantly keep an eye on that shutter speed to get better shots in this type of location. Okay, so that's me for this week. I hope you've enjoyed that video. Something a little bit different on the channel. Got much more to come from here in Romania. I'm here for the rest of the week. Got any comments, leave them below, and I'll see you guys very, very soon.